While there are various theories of comedy, none of them offer an absolutely watertight universal formula for finding the perfect punchline. In a way, a joke is a miniature piece of theatre, and comedians and comedy writers have to come up with characters and situations that create combinations of the two that are unexpected and odd, as Kriya learned when she met up with Riyad Musa and friends. When the world gets complicated and we need an antidote to uncertainty and stress, laughter can be the best medicine. The comedy industry in South Africa has really blossomed over the last few years, with a number of comedy clubs opening and more and more artists entering the industry. Today I get to hang out with a guy and some of his friends. He specifically has been in the industry for as long as I can remember and he's really grown and diversified his career. Today is exactly what the doctor ordered. I was looking forward to being treated by Dr. Riyad Musa and his colleagues. Riyad, how's it going? Good, good, good. So nice to be here, so nice to have you on the show today. Happy to be here. Are you nervous? I'm nervous. Now, I've actually learned to delay my nerves. After many, many years of doing this, <laughs> I only get nervous a few seconds before the time. How do you put together, let's call them the band of brothers? I like to have a mix of like the old guard and experience and the new guys coming up, you know? So the old guys sell the tickets and the young guys, you know, we slowly sort of um, expose them to the market and hopefully when they become famous, <laughs> they can, you know, throw back a little bit to the old <laughs> All right, well, I want to get to know you a little bit better before the show, so shall we go chat? Let's do it. Let's do it. Jason Goliath, Joey Razdeen, Kahisa Mohadi, Loris Ogola, Mark Lottering, Shimmy Isaacs and Simi Arif were among the familiar faces who joined Riyadh for the show. So Riyad, tell me what it was like growing up in Cape Town. It was uh, sort of regular. I was on a trajectory to, uh, you know, becoming a doctor. I always wanted to be a doctor. Both my parents are doctors. So I spent most of my, my time with my nose in a book. Just, ooh, you know, studying constantly. Maybe playing tennis here and there. And then I started magic when I was in uh, uh, Standard 7. So where did the interest for magic come from? It came from a guy called Abu Bakr Bray. So he gave me this pamphlet and said, Riyadh, we have to do this. It was a college of magic and I thought, wow, let's do this. So I told my folks and we agreed to go. But he ended up not going because his parents said magic was haram. So he's in IT today. My dad always said I could do whatever I want to as long as I become an orthopedic surgeon first. So no pressure there. Um, yeah. Why didn't you pursue magic? I did. I did children's magic parties for a bit of extra cash. And in fourth year medicine, I got exposed to stand-up comedy for the first time. I went to some sort of stand-up comedy gig and I realized that this is the thing that I actually wanted to do. And I ditched the magic wand and I just, you know, settled on the microphone. Now in the past, there's no debate on whether you spank or don't spank. It was just one shot, at least. That was the extent of the communication and the negotiation. Now tidy this place up. No! Uh... Uh... You weren't even allowed to cry. Why are you crying? I'll give you something to cry about. How do you know, you know, if you've gone too far with a joke or if this joke is still kind of safe? My primary aim is to make the audience laugh. You know, I like to have some social commentary underlying what I do, but my job is to be an antidepressant. So I listen to them. If they're laughing, um, it's, it's important, you know, because th that's one of the things about comedy. You immediately know if you've gone the wrong way. You ever been eating, catch your wife or your partner looking at you with that look of adoration? <laughs> Do you really need to eat like that? Do you really need to? Because the thing is, you know, when I eat like people, I make a little sound, that, you know? Just a little, just, just. I keep my mouth closed, but invariably, I make the little, because I've got a sinus problem, so air has to go through my oral cavity to create that, just a little. It's just a tiny. But my wife is always like. So with comedy, you kind of diversified your career and you went into movies. Where did that decision come from? The journey to do material and Long Walk to Freedom, it was just like this guy, Ronnie Aptierka, he loved my comedy. And when I was performing as a doctor in Johannesburg, I met him and he says he wants to do a movie with me. 
It took seven years and about 13 drafts of the movie material before we actually decided to do it. And on the back of the performance of material, I got a long walk to freedom. Welcome to the penthouse. Mr. Gregory, mm -hmm. we all sleep in the same room. Yeah. Then I'm putting in for a transfer. For medical reasons, Walter snores like a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Long Walk to Freedom, you played Ahmed Kachada. What was that like? We always think about the history of our country and all the horrible things that happened. It's almost just like words on a page. You're not always able to connect with the emotional content of it. As an actor, you actually have to internalize what these guys went through in order to have a good performance. So you have to internalize the fact that they were willing to die so that we could be free. Do you have any advice for youngsters wanting to get into the media industry? In anything, failure is not the enemy. It's part of the process to success. It's about being comfortable with the discomfort of failure. Uh, because that usually yields success if you don't give up. My wife on the other hand, she doesn't put a seatbelt on immediately because she's got important stuff to do before she puts on a seatbelt in the car and I value that she does important things, give the opportunity to do lots of important things because I value that she has important things to do. You know, so we're driving and like ding, ding, ding. Baby, wanna put on your seatbelt? Stop rushing me, you're always rushing me. Veteran in the industry, Ms. Mark Lutting, how are you doing? I'm great, how are you? Very good. So what can we expect from you this evening? I hope that people laugh. I, I want to be funny. I hope that I'll be funny and uh, we'll know within the first minute and that kind of anxiety just never stops. 19 years ago, when I walked on stage, I said to you, I come to you from the Cape Flats with love. But I can't say that anymore, because I was moved out. Because it made business sense. Now, I believe you must give everybody a chance to struggle. So you're closing off the show tonight. There's a very big difference between headlining and going last. Tonight, I'm going last on a lineup of headliners. For me, there's no intimidation because everybody's done well. Everybody's, I mean, busting it. I mean, I'm, I'm almost up now. And so the audience is warm already. So all I have to do is more of what they did. Welcome to the stage, Jason Goliath. Nothing can stop me. I'm all the way up. Indian people have developed a spice, guys. They've developed a spice. This spice is so intelligent that the CSI can't even find this thing. When the spice goes in a biryani, okay? As it lands in the biryani, it calls, come on, rice, 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 rice. And Ilachi will disguise itself. How? How do you hide an Ilachi? You can have an Ilachi with three grains of rice on your spoon. You will not see the Ilachi. My name is Jason Goliath. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It was awesome. Absolutely fantastic. I had fun. Jason Goliath rocked it. It was absolutely amazing. I'm such a big fan of Riyadh Musa. For the amount of laughs, it was well worth it. Mm -hmm.